Anesthesia for Non-Cardiac Surgeries, Unrepaired Tetralogy of Fallot. Non-cardiac surgery in patients with unrepaired tetralogy of Fallot is usually only performed in urgent cases or situations where additional congenital anomalies have to be addressed before the cardiac repair. There is a wide range of anatomic variations of tetralogy of Fallot, from the classic description with pulmonary stenosis to types with pulmonary atresia or absent pulmonary valve or only minimal outflow obstruction, the so-called pink tet. This video will focus on the most common form, tetralogy of Fallot with pulmonary stenosis. The learning objectives of this video are to explain the common preoperative evaluation and management considerations, provide an anesthetic management plan, describe specific non-cardiac surgical procedures and the considerations that need to be addressed when performing them and anticipate the post-operative considerations in patients with unrepaired tetralogy of Fallot. Pre-operative evaluation. Evaluation begins with a thorough history and physical examination. The patient's history should be carefully reviewed for the presence of coexisting syndromes or chromosomal anomalies like charge, factorial, and 22Q11.2 deletion syndromes, such as DeGeorge or filocardiofacial syndrome which can have significant implications for the anesthetic management. Many syndromes are associated with airway abnormalities, difficult vascular access, or metabolic problems. For example, DeGeorge syndrome, frequently seen in patients with tetralogy of Fallot, predisposes to immunodeficiency and hypocalcemia. In addition, potential episodes of recurrent cyanosis have to be thoroughly evaluated, especially frequency, timing, and triggering events like agitation. Although echocardiography will provide the most comprehensive information about the nature of the cardiac defect, the anesthesiologist will need a clear picture of the preoperative clinical status of the patient, including typical behavior and tetralogy fallot symptoms during stress and pain. During the physical examination, the general appearance should be assessed in regards to baseline irritability and obvious cyanosis. The facial features have to be carefully examined for any evidence of syndrome or potential difficult intubation. Velocardial facial syndrome can present with micronathia. The auscultation of the chest should focus on the baseline respiratory status and any evidence of aspiration. The typical machine-like continuous murmur of a patent ductus arteriosus is expected, if not hoped for, in a neonate with severe tetralogy of Fallot. The vital signs should be noted. With the PDA present, the oxygen saturations should be in the high 80s to low 90s. The remainder of vitals should be normal in a non-agitated infant. A low diastolic pressure can be a result of a significant runoff via PDA. Blood pressure gradients between the upper and lower extremities or pre- and post-ductal saturation differences can indicate additional defects or problems. Preoperative assessment of the hydration status is extremely important. Tetralogy of Fallot with pulmonary shunting is a preload dependent cardiac lesion, especially in the presence of a dynamic component. It is crucial to assess skin turgor, capillary refill, as well as the presence of a sunken fontanelle. Any obvious dehydration should be immediately corrected to decrease the risk of a hypercyanotic spell during induction. Finally, is vascular access present? Note the type and number of access points. Any current or recurrent medications should be documented and assessed for effectiveness. Neonates with severe tetralogy of Fallot and significant hypoxia are often started on a prostaglandin infusion to maintain ductal patency and improve pulmonary blood flow. The patient should be evaluated for the presence of a PDA murmur and improvements in oxygen saturations. Occasionally, an echocardiogram may be necessary to document ductal patency. Vasopressors may have been used in the form of continuous infusions or single bolus during episodes of sudden desaturation. Due to frequent and severe desaturations caused by agitation and irritability, the baby may already be sedated with narcotic or dexmedetomidine infusions. 
any current antibiotic therapy and the last dose should be documented to avoid accidental double dosing and toxicity. Routine evaluation with a comprehensive metabolic panel, complete blood count with differential, coagulation studies, and type and screen are necessary. Preoperative hematocrit and hemoglobin are especially important. In the setting of cyanosis, elevated red blood cell counts are the primary compensatory mechanism to guarantee adequate oxygen delivery to the tissues. Unless the delivery was traumatic, neonates have elevated hematocrit values in the first days of life and are relatively protected. Maintaining a baseline ECG is a routine practice preoperatively. Arrhythmias are not expected with unrepaired tetralogy of Fallot preoperatively, but are quite common after repair. One example is junctional ectopic tachycardia. Chest and abdominal x-rays are typically obtained and can provide some insight to the pulmonary status, heart size, and location of the aortic arch. The preoperative transthoracic echo will define the details of the cardiac defect. The morphology of the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, the gradient across the outflow tract, the exact location and number of obstructions, subvalvular, valvular, or supravalvular, and the presence of a dynamic component. In addition to right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, other important findings are ventricular septal defect and assess for potential additional atrial septal defects or muscular ventricular septal defects. The size and function of the ventricles can be determined as well as the anatomy of the ductus arteriosus and the gradient across the PDA. It is also important to look for the side of the aortic arch. A right-sided aortic arch is common in Tetralogy of Fallot and can have implications for the surgical approach during thoracotomies. In addition, the coronary anatomy and other cardiovascular abnormalities, such as an aberrant subclavian artery or a vascular ring, can be evaluated. Preoperative management. Standard monitors include pre- and post-ductal pulse oximetry, end tidal CO2, ECG, non-invasive blood pressure, and temperature. Depending on the clinical status and the extent of the surgery, close monitoring of blood pressure, frequent blood gas samples for ventilation adjustments, and a secure venous access for vasopressors may be necessary. The arterial blood pressure can be monitored via an umbilical artery catheter or a peripheral arterial line. CVP and mixed venous saturation can be surveilled from adequately placed umbilical vein catheters or PIC lines. Due to right-to-left shunting via the VSD, assessment of adequate ventilation with end tidal CO2 monitoring is less reliable and intermittent blood gases are required. Cerebral near-infrared spectroscopy can monitor tissue oxygenation and serves as a trend monitor and substitute for mixed venous saturations and cardiac output. An umbilical vein catheter or PIC line may have already been placed in the neonatal intensive care unit. If a prostaglandin infusion is running, it is prudent to have at least one other reliable form of vascular access for induction to avoid disconnection and inadvertent bolus administration. Otherwise, additional peripheral venous or arterial access can be placed after induction. Dehydration will lead to decreased right ventricular preload and tachycardia and worsen right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. It is important to ensure that the infant is well hydrated preoperatively. All emergency drugs for resuscitation and treatment of hemodynamic instability should be prepared in age and weight appropriate doses and dilutions. Epinephrine, calcium, phenylephrine, and atropine. In addition, medications and fluids for the treatment of test spells must be immediately available. Anesthetic management. TET spells or hypercyanotic spells with sudden, severe, and prolonged desaturation are a constant risk during surgical procedures in patients with unrepaired tetralogy of Fallot. Catecholamine surges due to inadequate levels of anesthesia during stimulations or rapid changes in preload or afterload can abruptly increase the dynamic component of the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction and lead to significant right-to-left shunting, unresponsive to oxygen.
in highly irritable patients, a gently titrated IV premedication with midazolam alone or in combination with small doses of ketamine can prevent agitation and hypercyanotic spells. As stated earlier, an umbilical vein catheter or PIC line may have already been placed in the neonatal intensive care unit. Depending on the clinical status, the scheduled procedure, and the anticipated postoperative course, further access may be necessary. Catheters in the umbilical vessels are often removed and replaced with alternative lines during abdominal surgeries or for long-term access. A peripheral invasive arterial line is important for close blood pressure monitoring and blood gas sampling. It can be placed post-induction. Ideally, induction should avoid positive pressure and be gradual enough to avoid hypotension. The limited pulmonary blood flow and the significant right-to-left shunt in patients with Tetralogy of Fallot will only allow for short periods of apnea despite pre-oxygenation and oxygen insufflation techniques. Close communication with the proceduralist is important to optimize the level of anesthesia and prevent acidosis and hypoxia. Due to the limited pulmonary blood flow and right-to-left shunting, bypassing the pulmonary circulation, the anesthetic uptake is slow and a prolonged induction and excitation period should be expected. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation can result in gastric distension, which decreases functional residual capacity and pulmonary compliance while simultaneously increasing the risk of aspiration of gastric contents directly into the lungs. In the setting of Tetralogy of Fallot, these ventilatory changes can lead to hypoxia, hypercarbia, acidosis, and decreased preload, all potential triggers for TET spells. Deep inhalational anesthesia with sevoflurane or large doses of propofol can cause a decrease in systemic vascular resistance and significant hypotension in neonates and will not be tolerated by an infant with severe Tetralogy of Fallot. Ketamine and rocuronium are an effective IV combination that do not decrease systemic vascular resistance. Fentanyl IV prior to endotracheal intubation decreases the risk of catecholamine surge and the infundibular spasm that may precipitate a TET spell. An intraoperative maintenance infusion of crystalloids with dextrose confers the benefit of avoiding dehydration and hypoglycemia simultaneously. The right-to-left shunt across the VSD and the overriding aorta predispose patients to Tetralogy of Fallot to paradoxical embolization. Air bubbles in the venous system can directly reach the arterial system and cause strokes and infarctions. Air filters should be attached to all lines with an additional stopcock placed distal to the filter to allow for transfusion of blood products. All injection ports and stopcocks need to be carefully de-aired before giving any medications. A fluid bolus of 10 to 20 cc's per kilogram of lactated ringers or normal saline can be used as a first step to maintain preload and support blood pressure. Careful attention to all aspects of ventilation is extremely important in patients with Tetralogy of Fallot. Right-to-left shunting via the ventricular septal defects makes the end tidal CO2 monitoring less reliable and frequent blood gas samples are necessary to avoid inadvertent hypoventilation. Traditional pulmonary vascular resistance reducing strategies such as higher FiO2, avoidance of hypercarbia and acidosis, and low peak inspiratory pressure and positive end expiratory pressure are less effective for the management of pulmonary blood flow in severe tetralogy of Fallot because the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction itself is the main limiting factor for antegrade flow. However, in the presence of a PDA as an additional source of pulmonary blood flow, attention to pulmonary vascular resistance and adequate ventilator settings are important to optimize the flow across the patent ductus arteriosus. When TET spells occur, increasing preload by volume expansion, stenting the right ventricular outflow tract open, as well as sedation with opioids to decrease tachycardia and catecholamine levels can improve pulmonary blood flow. If no IV access is available, abdominal compression by gentle pressure on the liver or pushing the legs up can provide an autotransfusion and temporarily augment preload for the right ventricle.
Selective alpha agonists like phenylephrine can increase systemic vascular resistance and thereby pressure in the left ventricle and limit the right-to-left shunt. Inhalational agents and short-acting beta blocker can reduce contractility and relieve infundibular muscle spasms. Bicarbonate can be used to treat acidosis. Anticipation of sympathetic stimulation, pretreatment with short and fast-acting narcotic like fentanyl, and maintenance of adequate levels of anesthesia are important anesthetic considerations. An age-appropriate or slightly higher blood pressure should be maintained to prevent excessive right-to-left shunting. For prolonged neonatal surgery in a cyanotic patient, careful fluid management is important. Addressing the impacts of blood loss on the preload-dependent tetralogy of Fallot physiology should be part of the preoperative team discussion. In general, blood must be readily available in the operating room along with robust venous access to administer large volumes of fluid if necessary. Blood and insensible fluid losses need to be closely monitored and substituted. The hematocrit should be kept above 35 to 40 percent to maintain adequate tissue oxygenation, and maintenance IV fluid should contain dextrose to avoid hypoglycemia. Surgical considerations for specific non cardiac procedures. Non cardiac surgery in patients with unrepaired tetralogy of Fallot is usually only performed in urgent cases or situations where additional congenital anomalies have to be addressed before the cardiac repair. The following list is not comprehensive but focuses on procedures with special implications for the tetralogy of Fallot pathophysiology. There are a few indications for urgent craniotomy in a neonate with tetralogy of Fallot. However, examples include teratoma, or large arteriovenous malformation, typically coiled endovascularly whenever possible. The risk of blood loss is generally high given the proximity of the surgical field to dural venous sinuses, but also dependent on the surgical approach. Direct laryngoscopy bronchoscopy are relatively frequently performed in neonates with tetralogy of Fallot, often to assess coexisting airway anomalies or the exact location of tracheoesophageal fistulas. Given the delayed inhalation induction in the presence of right-to-left shunting and the need for deep levels of anesthesia without causing hypotension or apnea, Various combinations of intravenous anesthetic like ketamine or remifentanil are often used to facilitate the airway management. Inadequate levels of anesthesia during tracheal stimulations can result in significant catecholamine surges and trigger TET spells and profound desaturations. Examples of thoracic conditions include congenital diaphragmatic hernia, large congenital pulmonary airway malformation, and esophageal atresia, tracheoesophageal fistula repair. Once considered a surgical emergency, neonatal repair of congenital diaphragmatic hernias is nowadays rather viewed as an urgent repair. The timing is based on the patient's status and the extent of lung hypoplasia and cardiac disease. Increased pulmonary vascular resistance and severe desaturations unresponsive to conventional treatment are feared complications during congenital diaphragmatic hernia repair. In combination with tetralogy of Fallot, massive right-to-left shunting via the ventricular septal defect can exacerbate the situation and lead to profound hypoxia. The best timing and indications for ECMO support should be discussed with the perioperative care team. Adequate depth of anesthesia and prevention of dynamic right ventricular outflow tract obstruction are important aspects. The type of anesthesia is dependent on the ventilator. A balanced anesthesia technique with volatile agents and narcotics can be used with an anesthesia machine whereas a mixture of intravenous anesthetics, such as morphine, dexmedetomidine, and midazolam infusions, is used with ICU ventilators. Aggressive ventilation and recruitment maneuvers must be avoided. Careful selection of appropriate ventilator settings and adjustments is important. Congenital pulmonary airway malformation resection. During the dissection phase and other key portions of the procedure, the surgeon often retracts and compresses the lung, which can result in a functional single lung ventilation with significant hypoxia and hypercarbia. 
Extensive recruitment maneuvers with large tidal volumes or high peak pressures can significantly decrease venous return and worsen the right-to-left shunting. Esophageal atresia, tracheoesophageal fistula repair. The exact location of the tracheoesophageal fistulas are often unknown. In 50% of cases, pre-repair bronchoscopy is performed to determine the number and position of tracheoesophageal fistulas and to facilitate optimal positioning of the endotracheal tube. Spontaneous ventilation avoids the risk of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and can be established with a remifentanyl infusion with or without partial monitored anesthesia care of inhaled volatile agent. Neonates with severe tetralogy of Fallot may not tolerate spontaneous ventilation due to intermittent airway obstruction, partial hypoventilation, or hemodynamic instability. If the neonate is not tolerating spontaneous ventilation, intubation with neuromuscular blockade can be used to secure the airway quickly. If the fistula is large or in a difficult position such as the carina, Bronchoscopy can facilitate the placement of an occluding Fogarty balloon catheter. Intentional right mainstem intubation and gradual pullback until bilateral breath sounds are present can help with positioning of the endotracheal tube until the patient is stabilized and the tracheobronchial tree can be inspected with a small fiber optic scope. Ventilation may be spontaneous or minimally assisted until the fistula is ligated. If a Fogarty balloon is in place, Positive pressure ventilation can be used earlier. The position and patency of the endotracheal tube should be checked frequently. Kinking and mucus plugs can easily occur during the long surgery in the lateral position. During positioning or dissection, the Fogarty balloon may suddenly migrate retrograde into the airway and cause an acute obstruction. Laparoscopy, laparotomy. Laparoscopy may be used for diagnostic purposes if catastrophic abdominal conditions are suspected but unconfirmed. Conversion to a laparotomy almost always follows if the diagnosis in question is confirmed. Examples of conditions include sudden intestinal perforation, necrotizing enterocolitis, strangulated hernia, volvulus, and more. Insufflation of the abdomen can compress the inferior vena cava, reduce preload to the right ventricle, and decrease pulmonary blood flow, which will lead to desaturation and hypoxia. Occasionally, these effects are counterbalanced by an increase in systemic vascular resistance. Depending on the current fluid status as well as the morphology and severity of the tetralogy of Fallot, abdominal insufflation may be poorly tolerated. During the preoperative discussion, the need for limited periods of insufflation with low pressures, ideally less than 10 millimeters of mercury, should be emphasized and clear thresholds for immediate desufflation and possible conversion to an open procedure established. Careful fluid management and maintenance of preload are also important during prolonged laparotomies with increased insensible losses and potential septic phasodilation. Often, additional low-dose vasopressor infusions are necessary to prevent severe desaturations and persistent hypoxia. Omphalocele and gastrochesis repair. The process of using a silo to position the intestinal contents in the abdomen can, similarly to abdominal insufflation or large volume ascites, restrict lung expansion, decrease preload, and increase systemic vascular resistance. Postoperative care. Even after an uneventful surgery, most patients with unrepaired tetralogy of Fallot and significant cyanosis will be admitted to an ICU with cardiac experience for a period of postoperative ventilation and close monitoring. Adequate sedation and pain control are important to prevent cyanosis and hypoventilation. This can also facilitate the management of staged repairs with the need for further interventions in the operating room or cath lab. A multimodal analgesia approach with intravenous acetaminophen, fentanyl, morphine, and regional anesthesia can provide effective pain control. 
morphine and or dexmedetomidine infusions in combination with continuous nerve blocks are frequently used after major surgery. Tetralgiophilo patients are still at risk for tet spells during emergence or after discontinuation of sedatives. Careful monitoring during these periods is important. Postoperative nausea and vomiting prophylaxis is usually not indicated in neonates.